Good morning, everybody. Wake up. Wake up, wake up. In Provincetown. This week featuring... Can I have some coffee? Wake up, wake up. Make it strong, please. Hey! Ho! Oh. Hey! Wake up, wake up! Oh. <laughs> Whee! No, really, can I have some coffee? Wake up, wake up! Good morning. Hey, everybody. It's Friday, March 15th. Wow. It's the Ides of March. Is that a day today? Yeah. The Ides of March, when they murdered Julius Caesar. Mm. And yesterday was pie day. It was? Yeah. Wow. Did you have some pie? No. Why not? I'm on a diet. You are? Yeah. How's your diet going? Well, I just got to the point um, at the end of January where it was um, lose a few pounds or buy new clothes and... One was cheaper than the other. So that's the one I went with. <laughs> but buying new clothes is fun. Yeah, but not in January when you have no money. I know. And in January when you're a 35 waist instead of a 32. It's, it's, it's tough. The, the struggle is real. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, 35 and stretchy, and it's still hard to get it's, on. That's where I was. Good thing this table is like <laughs> up to here. Do you know how you have that one pair of jeans where you're like, oh, when I whenever I put on a few pounds, I, that's the pair of jeans I wear? They're on now. Yeah. <laughs> When those no longer fit. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. We've got a great show yeah. for you today, guys. Thank you for joining us. Um, I got to hang out with Scott Coffee and Rod Vaughn. Coffee is coming back. As everybody knows, they burnt down to the ground last spring. Pretty much everything inside was lost. So Scott and Rod have spent the last year remaking clothes. They are like probably, I think, the only store in town where Everything that's for sale is like a piece of clothing mm. that was made there by the two people that you meet when you go in. I think they sell other other designers clothes but hand like handmade small you're gonna hear producer. all about it because they're coming back right. at the beginning of april to welcome you with open well not open arms because they're stitching and stuff mm. but to welcome you like by waving from the work table mm. we also have sam Paula coming in to talk of uh he's from the province of independent and he's going to talk about nappyville today Ooh, yeah. i love our independent voices segment who exactly. else do we got coming on we also have steve derosh coming in to talk about the story core that he's working on mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, Sounds like a good show. A good one. Yeah. Well, while we have you, um, we're also going to have Alex Morse on the show next week. Yeah, you guys tune in next week because, of course, annual town meeting is April mm -hmm. 1st. The town manager is going to come in and uh, talk about the warrant, which if you have the independent, there is a copy of the warrant here in mm. the paper. Yeah, Read there's... it first. Don't ask questions at the meeting. Yes. Mark is <laughs> imploring you in the kindest tone he has available to him. To read the warrant first before you stand up at town hall and say anything. Yeah. And also, if you're not going to read it, at least listen to the person who's presenting an article before you ask a question. Or if you don't read it beforehand, you don't get to ask questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't. No, my um, favorite is when the question is verbatim what the person just said. Right. Like, this article is about blah, blah, blah. And they're like, excuse me, what is this article about? And it's like, girl, yeah. we don't have the time for it. You have to be an informed citizen to take part. If you want to take part and have a voice, it comes with work. It's your civic responsibility. Duty. Yeah. 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 Read it. It's available now. Get your copy of The Independent at all newsstands. Mm. Farland Counter has them everywhere. The town website. The town website. You can read it free. online. Yeah. You don't have to buy a warrant. You can get it for free. If you go to Town Hall, they have them as well. Yeah. Get a warrant. Read your warrant. Yeah, and also I think part of being educated is assuming everyone else in the room is educated, meaning like, this is my personal pet peeve at town meeting when there's a housing article and someone gets up and is like, we need housing. Mm -hmm. We're like, yeah, we know. Um, let's talk about the article. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's my favorite time of the year. <laughs> I, I am not going to be there. What? I'm going to be in New Orleans. I'll just, I'll raise my hand twice. Thank you. Yeah. Proxy. He's my vote. Yeah. When he goes like this. I think that's how it works. So the, in true, I think that's how it works. Oh. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, it oh, is on April right. Fool's Day. Town meeting yeah. is on April Fool's Day, so it's opposite day. Though against the way you would normally mm -mm. vote. Mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but it's going to be exciting. Uh, Alex Morris is coming on to talk about um, some articles. I think specifically Mata Field he wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. we're, but we're going to grill him, obviously. <laughs> Friendly conversation. Friendly conversation. Yeah, it's my it's the the yearly episode where everyone gets mad at me. That's a lot of episodes. No. How was your weekend last week? Um, my weekend last week was really cute. We all got together um, at the Year Rounders Festival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how did it treat you? Um, of the five things that I was bidding on in the silent auction, mm -hmm. I ended up winning two of them. Whoever got that Under Armour backpack that I really wanted, mm. congratulations. Which two did you win? I won a gift certificate to the Crown and Anchor, mm. and I won a haircut from Joe Bruno. Oh, cute. I know. Both very utilitarian things. Yeah, things that I need and will use. Mm -hmm. um, and you got to support... Um, the Year Rounders Festival. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had never gone to the Year Rounders Festival before. It was really awesome. It's basically just a series of booths, um, a lot of like artists and artisans, but also a lot of like community organizations. We kind of piggybacked onto the Province on Business Guild's table. Um, it was really cute. Babes and Boys were there too. There was a pet parade. Mm. There were a lot of people in Someone town hall. Someone had a chicken. There was a chicken in the pet parade. Yeah. It was wild, but fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. it felt very P-Town. Yes, mm -hmm. it was nice to see everybody out and about. Um, and then, of course, the Oscars were on mm. Sunday. Well, my most exciting thing that happened at the Eurounders Festival, my take on it was we're beginning compost, townwide compost soon. Oh, I, I missed that. Yeah, yeah, um, which is really exciting. Um, as basically, m what from what I understood, they're going to create a compost at the transfer station. Mm -hmm. um, I think you still need to have a, a ticket to give it to them, but that's really exciting because I think a lot of people don't realize that obviously trash is bad, but what's also what's really bad is putting organic material into a trash bag because it produces so much methane when you do that. And it also, it no matter what you put in there, it's no longer biodegradable because in order to biodegrade, it has to, part of that is it returning to the earth. And if it's in a plastic bag, it will never be able to do that. Oh. Tune in on April 19th to learn more about it. Tune in on April 19th to learn more about it. I can't wait. I need I to know about this because composting is not something that I do or know anything mm. about. All of my garbage just goes into the same place. Mm. No. Bad, bad. I recycle. That's good. Yeah. But it's it's like an additional, it's like recycling is great and also composting is great. Cool. Yeah. I can't wait to find out more on April 19th. I get like... Yes, a few weeks ago, I was cleaning my apartment, and there was a, a shoe, a rock that it was stuck in, like my shoe, mm -hmm. and it like came out, and it was on the ground, and I picked it up and threw it in the trash can. Then I was like, oh, "That rock's going to be in that trash bag for eternity," and I got sad about that idea, and I picked it out of the trash and threw it out my front door. Like, we what have is to do our what part. is wrong with me? Our trash gets burned. Oh, really? Oh, then the rock comes out of the bag and is there on the pile of rubble. Oof. Um, but composting is also great. That's what happens to all of our trash? I believe most of our trash goes to that trash to energy plant in Fall River. Or wherever mm. you drive by that. Looks yeah. Really oh, there's a trash to energy plant. Great. Yeah. There's so much about this process that I do not know. I'm excited to have them on because I'm going to ask them what I've no, I don't know what happens to commercial compost once it we once it gets dropped off. Mm -hmm. Like when I compost at home, I have a big. Um, like galvanized tub, and then I put it into my garden. Mm -hmm. So maybe there will be a really great resource for really great dirt, which would be exciting. I love the sound of that. Even great more dirt. beautiful gardens in yeah. Provincetown. Great dirt. Yeah. Great dirt. <laughs> I'm excited about good dirt. I know you are. I'm excited <laughs> for you. Um, but Sundays were the Oscars indeed, and everywhere in town, CVS threw an Oscar party, <laughs> um, everywhere threw an Oscar party. But um, I hosted one right here with Tadana and Racine. Well, Tadana and Racine were the hosts. I was just a little special guest. Tadana and Racine did such a good job. I didn't. You should hang out with Racine. She knows everything about the Oscars, which I feel like you the same. We should do like an Oscars trivia and just have you two go head to head. I would love it. Yeah. But she was like, we were like, what? What did Annette Benning win? And she's like, she knows. She like knew everything. It was wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and she was dressed as Emma Stone from yes, Four Things. Yes, yes, yes. It was really cute. And you don't have a picture of that? I, I have. You do? Yeah. Oh, I have a picture of the three of us. I also have a picture of just me because 
I looked gorgeous. I'm going to say it. Who were you dressed as? Myself, a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous drag queen. <laughs> yeah. It had nothing to do with Barbie? Well, I, I just dressed like Oscar red carpet to arrive. And then I figured it was my last opportunity to do a Barbie number mm -hmm. um, as the Oscars were kind of the end of that store or the end of that media cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so I did do a number as Barbie. I dressed as weird Barbie mm -hmm. and did Creep by Radiohead. Yeah. No one does Creep by Radiohead. Yeah, I've never heard that song so in this It's so weird town. that you would perform that when no one ever does that. <laughs> right, exactly. <That's> so <laughs> but it was so much fun. We had a really good crowd. And from what I hear, all the Oscar parties in town had a really great crowd. So thank you to anyone who came out um, to support. Um, you get a little nervous when there's four parties happening on a Sunday in March. Wait, four? Does CVS really have a party? No, no. Uh, it was uh, Provincetown Brewing Company, the Bayside Betsy's, Crown and & Anchor, and Governor Bradford. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I think Sam and Carmen ran around and went to every one. You made it to yeah. all of them? Yeah, yeah. They, they left just before my weird Barbie number, though. I was bummed. I wanted Congrats. them to see it. Exactly, exactly. Congrats. Yeah. But um, it was tons of fun, and everyone came out, and it, it just made me feel warm to know that everyone. There's a pile of my hair. Gorgeous. They're, 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 <laughs> it's Sunday. It's, it's just like drag tumbleweeds in here. <laughs> <laughs> There yeah, were there very we little exactly. surprises that night, except for me personally. Nobody else was surprised by this, but Annette Benning lost again. Diane Warren lost again. There are a few people in my life who I really respect their opinions on movies, film, performances, acting. And you were definitely one of them, but also equally is Todd Flaherty. And he was like, it is ridiculous that Annette Benning is even nominated. No, it's Maybe not. he didn't Wait, actually did, say did that, he but he was like, Nyad? he was like, there's no way she's going to win. There was no way she was going to win, no. but she should have been nominated. Mm. That was a sentimental vote for me. I did end up losing the Oscar pool at my house because I bet on Annette Benning, and it cost me dearly. By the way, congratulations, Andy Toll. <laughs> but a lot of people thought that Emma Stone, who did win Best Actress, that was kind of a surprise. I thought Emma Stone was going to win. I, I think, think conventional too. wisdom was leaning toward Lily Gladstone mm. so that the Oscars could be like, look, the first Native American mm. to win an Oscar. But also people don't really think like that. Mm. I think people outside of the Academy are like, leave it leave it to these woke fools to do something like that. Well, I also think the Academy as a whole thinks like that. But when you get down to individual people, they're going to pick who they liked the best, who they thought did the best right. performance. And I mean, did you watch Killers of the Flower Moon? I didn't. It, I didn't really. I mean, it's an important true story mm. to tell and I'm glad that I know more about it but as a movie I was just it was a slog for me mm. tough to get through I still think Barbie should have won everything I also picked Barbie for production design and lost that mm. one who did win that I don't remember poor things oh well they were great too poor things did win a lot yeah they it's a very well done movie oh yeah did you see it yeah mm. I love that one. Yeah, but Emma Stone, twice Best Actress. I know, good for her. I read, I, I read, I, I need to stop doing that. I saw a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw a TikTok that said that Emma Stone is the most bankable star, like quietly bankable star. 12 of the last 15 of her movies have made three times their budget, which is crazy. Good return on investment, mm -hmm. that Emma Stone. She needs to play more Asian women. No. What in the hell? Less does that Asian mean? women. She, she played a Hawaiian native. When? Um, I can't remember what movie that was, but it was a few years ago and not great. I don't recall that. <laughs> Ethan's like, no. But I love Emma Stone. I've loved her since Easy A. House Bunny, oh. which was even before Easy A. Really? Yeah. And I, I watched her on the Partridge Family show that she was on. There was a Partridge Family show? That's how, That's why she's a redhead. When she was like 15 or 16, they did a reality show to recast the Partridge Family, and she was up for Lori as the oldest daughter, I think. You really have like deep knowledge of Emma Stone's filmography. I love her. And she dyed her hair red for that show and continued having red hair. Hmm. The more you know. Yeah, but my favorite part was the Billie Eilish performance. Eilish. <laughs> Uh, the Billie Eilish performance and also the fact that she won. She's now the... Um, Speaking of people who have two Oscars and she's like 23 years old. The only? youngest person to ever have two Oscars. The only person to win Best Song twice. Really? Yeah. No one has won Best Song mm -hmm. twice before? No. The only person to win Song of the Year and Best Song at the Oscars. And the only person born this century to have two Oscars. Good for them. Yeah. 
I love that song. It was too. so deserving. Yeah. yeah, it was especially to these days. I feel like ballads used to be things that were more celebrated, mm -hmm. but lately, like ballads aren't a big thing on the radio. But um, it's exciting to see a ballad kind of I know. take over. She won me over. She's one of those people that's been so big for it seems like a long time. It's really mm -hmm. only been a couple of years. But that first album, I was like, meh. It's like I don't understand what this, why everybody loves this so much. Mm -hmm. And now, now I know. Mm -hmm. Very Congratulations. Yeah. yeah, so good. Um, I loved what they did with the um, presenters for mm -hmm. the acting categories. Mm -hmm. They had like five people who had won it in the past who just gave like really heartfelt, like this is why you deserve being nominated. Mm -hmm. It was really cute. Yeah. They lasted that I think in 2009. I think they should do it every year. Yeah, I love it. So. And it also like brings out all the people that have made the Oscars a thing to watch. Especially when it's like somebody that has a personal connection with the nominee, like, uh, Rita Moreno and mm. um, America Ferrera. Right. That was, like, you couldn't have written that better. Mm. Perfect. Yeah. But good Oscars. I rarely watch them. I think that's the only time I would want to watch them is like with a group of friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had a little Oscar viewing party, right? We did. And Andy Toll won your pool. Andy won the pool. Who won it here? I think Britta won the pool here. Yeah. Yeah. It was very cute. Um, Todd was doing a fun thing where there was a bingo of just like random things happened. Mm -hmm. One of them was like Diane Warren loses and looks sad. <laughs> so I was like, bingo. Exactly. Um, and if you won bingo, you had to, you got a free beer and then you had to give an acceptance speech and then whoever won an ex whoever had the best acceptance speech won a gift card. Oh, that's fun. It was really cute. That yeah. was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Next year I'll come here. Yeah, but great Oscars. Did you get up to anything else this week? A um, little bit of this, a little bit of that. Simona <laughs> trivia I co-hosted. Oh, how would that go? Um, predictably wild. Mm -hmm. You know, people crawling on the floor, people doing shots. Um, my team won. Weren't you hosting? I was co-hosting. This is the thing. So I'm with my team while we're answering Mona's questions because I don't know what she wrote. Mm. And while I'm asking my round, my team doesn't know the answers to that. Mm. So I was like, So you I, like play slash I feel host. like I can play. And mm -hmm. then but then when you win and you're also the co-host, there's always somebody who's like, Yeah. And I was like, it's fair and square, you guys. I would one thing I do not do is cheat at trivia. I have hosted it for a long time. I promise you, if I'm ever winning, it's on the up and up. Uh-huh. Uh, trivia last night here at the... <laughs> what do you mean, uh-uh? Um, that was like when, when me and Benji went down to the gathering and we were doing trivia there and Alex, who writes the questions and owns the gathering, was sitting with us mm -hmm. and he eventually had to move away because we were getting all of them right. He's like, everyone's going to think we're cheating. Right. Yeah. Um, but trivia last night was really great. We had Brittany Ralph's co-host. She did her round entirely on Broadway, which had like 60% of the people happy. Yeah. 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 Some people just don't know, which... You either know it or you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. everybody's a huge Broadway fan. Yeah. But it was um, a ton of fun last night. I also, what, just one thing I did yesterday, I got my eyes, I had to drive off Cape to get an eye appointment, got my eyes dilated and didn't realize you couldn't really drive after. So I was like stuck off Cape for two hours waiting for my eyes to come back to life. Why did you have to drive so far away? There's I just eye need, doctor here. I just needed an appointment ASAP and that was just the closest mm. one. Yeah. How are your eyes? Great, perfect. I mean, not perfect, but perfectly broken. Broken in a perfect way. Yeah. You wear contacts? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wasn't wearing them for a while, and I was like, oh, I need these, mm. which is why I needed it right away. Um, but it was fun. Also, a few announcements. Mm -hmm. This Sunday is Serve here at the Provincetown Brewing Company in honor of St. Patrick's Day. Sam and Carmen are going to be cooking, cooking up Sam's family recipe. The food of our people. Yes. Yeah. Corned beef, cabbage, babes and boys, 12 to 5. Yes. Yes. 12 to 5 right here at the Provincetown Brewing Company. Yeah, go to Babes and Boys Instagram. There'll be a link in their bio to get tickets. Um, and St. Patrick's Day, this is green. I don't know if you guys can tell, but this is green-ish. I'm not wearing green. Um, <laughs> but all the proceeds go to support Babes and Boys who do a so much work creating amazing spaces around town, specifically for women. So awesome, awesome stuff. But first, if you are in town this weekend, please join us at the Commons tonight from mm. 5.30 to 7 for our fundraiser to save the Jamaican church in Truro. Yes. What else is happening this weekend? Also, yesterday morning, um, Benji did a collaboration with At Design, which is Instagram's design Instagram. Mm -hmm. Like, it's run by Instagram. Um, if you go to their, it's At Design on Instagram. I think probably their most recent post is a um, reel of a bunch of images that Benji created. And it's really great. Go check it out. Nice. Yeah. I think he has um, a brain picture today, so we're thinking about him. Yes. And also, guys, if you are planning on going clamming today, low tide is at 10.06. It's a little gray out there, but I think it's done raining for the day. It rained earlier this morning. It's cool and gray, mid-40s. No, it's not done raining. Is it raining right now? 
Oh. I <laughs> lied. It's not done, and it is actively raining. Thank you, Ethan, for yeah. the correction. We're real, not, real we're, time connections. We're not meteorologists, and we also refuse to look out the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> oh! Yeah. <laughs> um, there was something in the news this week. What happened in the news this week? Um, there was this came really abruptly, and obviously it was talked about um, in the last year or so. But the House voted on what essentially is a ban of TikTok. Basically, it's uh, eliminating foreign countries' involvement in social media in America. And because TikTok has Chinese-based ownership, basically they the they have to sell off that ownership to an American or other foreign-based business, or they are going to be removed from the app stores within America. Mm. They say that this is because they don't want the Chinese government collecting our data. And I feel like I sound like a conspiracy theorist, but um, the Chinese government can buy our data. They just, they're just saying like they can't collect it themselves. Like they could buy it from Facebook if they wanted to. Um, but I think TikTok has become a really useful tool for connecting people, the spread of information. Especially and, younger people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, this is where my conspiracy theory comes in, I guess. But I think that is why they're moving so quickly to ban TikTok. I think they're, I mean, Starbucks, there was a Starbucks boycott brought up a few months ago, and I think they lost $10 billion in market capital in a week. And there's also a Kellogg's boycott happening because they gave, did you, did you hear about this? Eat cereal for dinner. Yeah, it was basically like the modern day let them eat cake. It was like, oh, if you're broke, eat cereal for dinner. Great advice, Kellogg's. But um, like th that has been happening. We've also been able to see the genocide happening in Palestine in real time, which has changed the perception of the Israel-Palestine situation for a lot of young people. And in, even the uh, there was a leaked audio recently that said that TikTok is the problem in the young people having certain opinions about what's happening in Palestine right now from people based in Israel. There are a lot of people getting their news from TikTok. Yeah. Um, That's what they buy Stanley mugs and Trader Joe's bags. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a very powerful tool and it can be used for good or for bad. And w I mean, we've seen Facebook and Instagram mostly being used for bad, so. I mean, I do think that social media is, I know everyone is currently watching this on social media, but aside yes. from watching this morning show, social media is pretty bad. A lot of society's ills. Oh yeah. You know? But I mean, if you look back historically, there is always a conflict that happens shortly after any big expanse in how we connect. Like when you look at how like World War I relates to the invention of the radio and the Vietnam War relates to the invention of the television, anytime you bring people together, it creates conflict. Mm -hmm. And we are living in a conflict that has been created by social media. I think the Korean War was when the TV came mm. out. Yeah, that was in the 70s. Mm. But I get your point. <laughs> Color television. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, but like it's a known phenomenon that anytime people start to connect more, it always creates conflict. Sure. But I mean, don't you remember in 2016, there was literally legitimately Russian interference. Like I remember oh, being yeah. on Facebook and people like Svetlana, like all these like Russian names, like commenting on everything. And I was like, who are they? These are not real people. Mm. And it was all these Russian names. And I was like, Hopefully, any level-headed person will know that this is just like... I got accused of being a Russian bot on Provincetown Community Space around that time. You did? Yes. My retort was, maybe if you looked up to, at the person serving you drinks, you would know that I'm not a Russian bot. Oh. <laughs> it was the customer of yours that said it? It was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, a few other news stories. This past week, our Governor Maura Healey moved to pardon thousands of people. Um, she asked a group of elected officials to approve a plan that would pardon misdemeanor cannabis possession convictions. This will impact hundreds of thousands of people. Um, this is the most comprehensive action um, by a state official since 
Joe Biden pardoned federal cannabis possession convictions and called on state leaders to do the same. And when asked more, Healy said, the reason we do this is simple. Justice requires it. Thank you, Governor Healy. Yeah. I mean, people are sitting in jail for things that we do every day now. Yeah. yeah. So I think that is great and fair. Um, who wants to talk about sports? I guess you do. <laughs> what happened? I have two sports stories, um, but one of them is gay and one's about women. So perfect. Uh, so this past week, there was a soccer proposal. It's the first first openly gay pro soccer player. Mm -hmm. He proposed to his boyfriend on the pitch, um, which is a huge display of homophobia has existed so strongly within the sports realm. And to see that is a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the team helped him accomplish this. Um, so he has the support of his team, which is great. We've seen pro athletes come out and their careers suddenly become weirdly derailed. So it's good to see that this openly gay soccer player is getting a ton of support from his entire organization. What's his name? Um, Josh Cavallo. Josh Cavallo. Yeah. Um, a a Europe-based, uh, an uh, English-based soccer player. Mm -hmm. um, next. Um, so while we were on break, the... Uh, PWHL, which is a women's professional, the professional women's hockey league mm -hmm. started their season. And there's been a lot of talk about their jerseys because they were ugly and <laughs> they were so ugly, but they're kind of still ugly. But there was a big, um, they made changes to the jersey, which I think is really fun. So basically the PWHL and Molson, the beer company, mm -hmm. um, Molson is a big sponsor of the PWHL and they rearranged their jerseys because they found that, so you know, a typical soccer jersey or a typical sports jersey has a big number and then your name over the top. Mm -hmm. They found that because it's a women's sports league, so many of the women's names were being blocked by their ponytails. Uh. So Molson partnered with them, bought, got them all new jerseys made and basically underneath the number would typically have a, there's a little spot that would typically have a sponsorship mm -hmm. and instead they paid for new jerseys where the sponsorship and the name was swapped mm -hmm. and so that it's tiny where it says Molson a big number and then underneath the number it says their last name and as part of the campaign and the new jersey design they mm -hmm. started the campaign that's called the see my name campaign mm -hmm. and Molson released advertisements that said we'll cover our name so that you all can see hers oh yeah I think that's really cute and special that is really cute and special. Um, do I? Have... I was going to say, I bet all the other sponsors are thrilled. Like, what? Didn't make the name of the business teeny tiny under her ponytail. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I'm talking about it now, so they're getting. I mean, yeah, smart. What? Yeah. Um, I think that's all I have for news stories. Do you have anything else? Just sad. Everything that I read this week was sad and depressing, and it was about people getting shot dead on the subway in New York, and people getting shot dead in dog parks in Tampa. Um, it, the world is a deep, dark, scary place. Just be careful out there, you guys. Yeah. But the, the, the Tampa dog park, this is what really gets me, is that there was a gay guy walking his dog in a dog park, and one of his neighbors shot and killed him. And it is being he's being charged with a hate crime. He had been threatening and harassing this man for a year at the same dog park. Can you imagine not even being able to safely take your dog to your local dog park for fear that your neighbor might shoot you dead just because you're gay? And he also, I think, texted friends that morning saying that he's like, I'm worried this guy's going to kill me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, you know, of course, when the police showed up on the scene, he was like, oh, I, I did that in self-defense. I mean, what? That's crazy. And then these texts come out where the victim had texted his friends that morning saying, this guy is not leaving me alone and I think he might end up killing me. And then it happened. So we're That's very, wild. very fortunate that we live in a place where that is not as likely to happen. Mm -hmm. But also be careful out there, everybody, and um, talk to your neighbors, love each other. Yeah. You know? As town meeting approaches. <laughs> yes. Please love your neighbor at town meeting. Yes. Um, another story you reminded me of. We had spoke um, probably a few weeks ago about Next Benedict mm -hmm. and um, their death after an altercation in a high school bathroom mm -hmm. where they were severely beaten. They passed away the next day. And the initial ruling was that the death had nothing to do with the altercation the day before. And they finally released the cause of death, which is, it changes the story a little. Basically, they next died by suicide, which is hard to, it's, 
yes, the the death itself physically was not related to the beating they received the day before. But I think when you take a step back and really look at the cause of why that happened, like there has to be a correlation between the abuse that queer people experience in the school system mm -hmm. and these suicides. Jesus. Yeah. The I mean, the suicide for trans people in general is extremely high and especially for trans children. And I think if you are in a position where your job is to keep children safe, that includes all children. Mm -hmm. And the school board in Owasso where this happened in Oklahoma very much is like, we keep, they would, they're prioritizing the comfort of these three straight cisgender people over the life of this non-binary person. Mm -hmm. And the governor called this this dead child filth. Ugh. Said we don't want filth we don't want that filth in our state. After she passed away. A dead child called them filth. It's crazy. Whew. So that's all the dark news we have for you guys. One more announcement. No! This, co this coming Tuesday is oh. the Mario Kart tournament at oh, the right. Crown and Anchor. Um, it's hosted by Giselle. Uh, proceeds benefit Summer of Sass. It's going to be a ton of fun. I'm going to be there winning. If you are really good at this <laughs> game, please be in town on Tuesday. I, I'll never hear the end of it if he wins this stupid thing. No, regardless if I win or not, it's going to be so much fun. And I'm really excited. You guys, please enjoy this interview with Scott Coffey and Rod Vaughn. And as soon as you get a chance, head over to 173 Commercial Street and say hi to them in person. Take it away, Sam. Hi, everybody. I'm at 173 Commercial Street. Coffee. The store coffee with Scott Coffey and Rod Vaughn. You guys, thank you for making some time to talk to me today. Welcome. We have missed you. The town has missed you. How have you been? A little bored. Yeah. 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 It's it's strange when you don't when you work every day and then you stop working and right. then you realize you have no hobbies because your hobby is working and then you're like, what do I do? So we did some pop ups and stuff this summer. We made right. stuff this summer. We did a couple of things, but it was very strange, not ha not being half an hour late for being somewhere. And you were out of here for when did the store burn down? You said it was May, right? Ron? Last May. I thought it was April. No, May. I just sort of blocked it out. Yeah. Almost a year though. It's been almost a year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, long year. That's a long time. Yeah. And I know you had a lot of stuff going at the time. You had a lot of stuff planned already that... Well, we lived with it. I lived with it at my apartment. He lived with what we saved right. at my apartment, his apartment, other places. So there was just kind of... We've also been living with boxes for years. <laughs> so. Yeah, and my apartment is tiny, tiny. So everything... My apartment for the, has just been like, <clears throat> it's just literally like a little path to get to a bed. Mm -hmm. And Rod has a sewing studio next door, so um, he was able to make some things next door and store some things next door, luckily. Yeah. Um, but he had just made so many bathing suits before. Anyway, that's, that happens. They burned. They, <laughs> they did. Um, but, the but we work in the winter. Really but we work in the winter for summer, so that's the thing. Like when everyone's on vacation, we're actually that's when we work the most. So we work every day to fill up the store in the mm -hmm. summer. Then when the summer happens, we we lighten up a little bit and have some fun with the customers, and then we make things, but not at that kind of a rate. Right. And you are going to open this back up to people in a couple of weeks. Yep, a couple of yeah. weeks. Right. Why not? Aren't you excited yeah, but to people, see everybody again? We people can stop by. I mean, we're here. We're working. No, I've said before, this is my social life. Space. I don't, I used to go out every night when my hours were 40 hours a week. And, and this is, people come here to entertain us. Mm -hmm. And so then we don't have to necessarily be sad we're missing tea dance because they come in to see us. Right. And you catch up with everybody and... Uh, and then yeah. it burned. And it's fun. And it's, but it's fun. <laughs> what, what are you working on now, Ross? <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. It's just like, it's a lot of work this job, but it's, it's uh -huh. completely fun because the customers are fun. We've, right. been, we've been working together probably close to 20 years making yeah. clothes. Where did you meet each other? Um, just, he had Roots. another store and I was working at Roots. We worked, he, his store was next to where I was working and he didn't know what he was doing. So, um, did that change? Well, he walked no. in. So, I believe the opening line was when he walked in, says, "You need help here." Uh, All great friendships start that way. And, uh, <laughs> and when you are best friends this close in life, working together in a confined space, how do you not drive each other crazy? Oh, we do. We do. Yeah. No, no. 
<laughs> I'm quick to temper. Rod doesn't listen. You are. And then I, you don't. I, I've never held a grudge in my life, so I get mad, and then two seconds later, I'm not mad. So he just doesn't. We listen don't. He's from New I'm Jersey. Perfect. I'm from Missouri. We're just reactive. And you tune out all that nonsense. I'm not taking a side. It sounds like I'm taking a side. Oh, I'm when'd you get here? Well, that's what people, <laughs> people from New Jersey, Missouri talk speak very differently. We you yeah, take four I, years to finish a sentence, well, and, and I, we I, go I, to the point. Well, I never heard my parents raise their voice one time, and that's all your parents did. <gasps> Not my parents. Uh, but, oh, that's right. They but burned. New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to live up to my parents, but I'm not happening. Let's talk about generational trauma as we move on <laughs> this way to this gorgeous coat rack. Well, um, we're always trying to change it up a little bit right. and keep yourself interested, but also keep some of things the things that people love you and know you for. Like I have so many coffee belts. Your jackets have always been very popular. Marveling at this space because I mean I did. It come is a lot, lot different. It's so different. So back there used to be like a workroom yeah. hidden from people's view. Yes. And now you want to just put it all out there. We, we want to say this is what it looks we, like we, back we, here. Well, yeah, we were like, we were hiding away making clothes, and now we're like, well, now when you walk in the store, you know, we're making the clothes right here. Right. It's not made in the back room by you know somebody it's us we've been doing it all along but and because we're a little behind schedule this way we can actually keep making them when they come in as mm -hmm. opposed to having to stop come around say hi yeah uh, so now we can just go hi if you need me we're here and keep that sign you used to put up that was like i'm not here when really you were you don't have to use yeah that and you anymore. say well, uh, kind of open <laughs> kind of open which is yeah which is means you know just don't expect too much right come in warm up <laughs> right we went up to cape and got a fancy desk like they used well, to have in retail in New York. We're going to mix a lot of antiques with the home goods. So, like, if you look in the cases we're in over here, mm -hmm. I was an antique dealer for many years. And when I traveled, I did collect a lot. So we're mixing uh, antiques and, you know, different objects with the clothes. Um, so we don't... We don't have it was in there. an antique store down in town where he rents a case for the summer. Mm -hmm. So he tells the antiques here. They sold the building. So we're like, well, let's just move it here. Oh. And uh, he just carried that in the rain the other day in Richard's car. Um, or here but uh yeah so basically it's the same thing you were doing just here yeah basically so ross gonna be here a lot more he's still at jonathan williams salon but um i need help so he's gonna help i know and you got i mean you're ready to be up and running it looks like so pretty Almost close there we've yeah. been worse in july so this is pretty <laughs> good we have i mean we don't really have we have tons of stuff in the stitchers tons of stuff in the works we lots of stuff have done. We don't have a lot of pants yet. We don't have a lot of shorts yet. But it's a little more. And it will come. And yeah. then we're, we've started on lines of linen, which we'll have that out for the spring. It's really, really like nice. But I mean, starting in very early April, everybody, they're going to be here with the door open. They're going to be working the whole time. You can come in and say hi. It's not really bothering them. Let us know if you're good at ironing. <laughs> if you'd, be, you'd be happy to have your help. Yeah, if, if you're you, handy or you can help, they'd love if to you're see so, you. If you so, let us know. If you can. If you, uh, because we have, we have work. Yeah. Uh, uh, we won't pay you, but you can uh, <laughs> you can help us. Yeah. Come in and see these guys. This has always been one of my favorite stores through all of its locations and iterations. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Of course, it's good and to see you guys. Been yeah. too. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being back. <laughs> well, here's not that long. Come in and say hi, guys. No. It burned. Stop. You guys, please go say hi to them. I love this guy so much. That yeah. was a really fun, it was a freewheeling, fun interview. Difficult to edit when you're talking to people that are just laughing the whole time. You know what I mean? <laughs> just to cut out all the laughs. Yeah. Nice. Uh, but thank you guys. No, that sounded like fun. Please welcome yeah. back to the show our friend Steve DeRoche. Hey, how are you, Steve? I'm great. How are you guys? I'm really good. good. Yeah. You took the long walk over from your office. I did. <laughs> Actually, from Pearl Street. So it was Ooh. Long. Damn. Yeah. Um, tell me a little about StoryCorps. I'm not really familiar with it. Tell me about like how it works. Sure. So StoryCorps is, it's a free platform. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an app. I mean, anybody can do it. The program started about 20 years ago and it started by this guy named David Isse. It's a reporter and he put a recording booth in Grand Central Station and just grabbed two people who knew each other and said, can I just record a conversation about anything? Mm. And it kind of uh, evolved from there. Mm. And the program itself evolves from um, during the depression, the Works Progress Administration to put out of work journalists and writers to work. They sent them out um, to uh, interview everyday people. And that's kind of the birth of the modern concept of the oral history. Mm -hmm. And that this movement kind of uh, took off from there that it's everyday people that drive history, not just the rich and powerful, mm -hmm. so that you get to know what people, you know, a farmer in Kansas thinks about things. And that was kind of new in the 30s. That was rare. And so that's really what it was um, kind of evolved into is this oh, wow. story core. And um, one thing in particular has evolved is that they have this one small step 
I'm not cut out for it, but they take people of two opposing political views mm. and just say, let's take a deep breath and just have a conversation. That sounds valuable. Valuable, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I've listened to them and I'm like, okay, I would flip out there. So right, I'm, right. I'm not cut out You're for wrong. it. <laughs> I, I think what could be important in that same vein is like rather than taking like say a Trump supporter and a Democrat and making them argue, like there's there's you can people can have opposing views from the same side. You know what I mean? Totally. And those are conversations that don't get don't happen often enough because we're focusing on this crazier, mm. bigger conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But how did you get interested in doing these stories? Well, in high school, we had, in, um, when I was in um, history class, we had to interview somebody and record it um, that had lived through World War II. Mm. Um, so they didn't have to serve, but just what was their experience mm. like? And I interviewed my grandfather. And my grandfather's been gone now 20-something years, but I can still hear his voice and mm -hmm. hear his stories. And as I get older and forget these stories, I have right. a record of them. Mm. Um, so then I started to do these recordings with my dad recently, just to get family stories down. But the Provincetown project I'm doing, I wrote a piece for Provincetown Arts that was a drag history of Provincetown, a drag performance history. Oh, wow. And it took me three years to do because it was so hard to find primary sources to just sort of establish things. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, it was a clandestine art form for a long time, mm -hmm. even here in Provincetown. Mm -hmm. um, so as I'm doing it, I thought, you know, I should create or contribute to the historical record that I wish somebody had done 100 years ago, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I started with drag performers in town mm -hmm. and just to get their stories down. And then I was like, you know, I should just keep going and just interview all kinds of people about anything. I interviewed my neighbor about being Canadian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so you're from Canada. What's up with that? Like, and um, What's going on up there? And if you just ask like a few questions, like I've done one with you, Bob, done one with Mark, it just... Um, if you just have a free flowing conversation, like what you pick up in that conversation, um, you guys know in the show, it's right. interesting in real time, but then as it ages, it becomes more and more interesting because people in the future will be as curious about us as we are about people in the past. Mm. So um, that's why I like it. And I encourage everybody to kind of investigate doing it themselves um, just to kind of document and add to the historical record because I'm sure you've had the experience of wanting to know more about something in Provincetown's past mm. and you just hit a brick wall, there's mm -hmm. just nothing. Right. It's especially hard with queer history because for so long it had to be hidden mm -hmm. and that now that there is this now that it doesn't have to be hidden anymore it's hard to uncover it from when it was hidden absolutely absolutely and like maybe it's a little, like control freak in me but um you know if what i've always loved about journalism is they say that you're writing the first draft of history mm -hmm. and um i want to make sure that when i'm gone um I, I'm not an ambiguous spirit in the world. <laughs> like this is what I thought about right. things, mm -hmm. and take it or leave it. And you know, this is whatever. But um, and I find people are the same. You know, and whenever I ask people, the most common thing they say is, "Oh, I don't really have anything interesting to say," right. and that is rarely true. Sometimes, but rarely. <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> who, who were some of your favorites that you talked to? One of my favorites um, was David Mayo. Which is that if he said it three times in a row. I, I don't have anything interesting to say. And he and I have become good friends. I think he's about 84, lived most of his life here. He's of the Mayos, mm -hmm. big Provincetown family. And uh, I was like, David, that's not true. Like, you, I mean, everybody's got a story. And then he mm -hmm. pauses and goes, Yeah, you know, my ex wife and I went to see Nina Simone at the A House. I was like, well, that would be an interesting story. It's a good story. <laughs> yeah. exactly. But then he went on from there, like, oh, I, I used to party with Eartha Kitt before she hit it big because she played her all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, and he told the story about, sadly, before he was born, he had a sibling who passed away when he was only two years old. So his parents were devastated and the community was really worried about them, you know, and checking in on them. And the McMillans of McMillan Wharf were friends and stopped by and to kind of cheer them up when they came back from Greenland they gave his parents these uh, indigenous boots and kayaks. And there's the harpoon that um, they, he gave them is still on his wall in his house in the East End. Oh, wow. And that his mother for years, she lived to be almost a hundred, for like 40 years, um, she would kayak into town because mm -hmm. the grocery store was kind of downtown. So she would kayak in, and that's, that's everybody knew her, but she had that's this wild. Inuit, mm -hmm. I think Inuit kayak. So yeah, the person who thought he was completely uninteresting, I think we <laughs> talked for two hours. Like everything he had to say was completely fascinating. It's wild. Yeah. Um, are there any other stories you're kind of itching to get recorded? Yeah. In May, um, and their names just walked right out of my head, but they, they were the, the day that marriage equality was instituted in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. 
these two guys became accidental celebrities. Um, they're from Alabama. They mm -hmm. saw it on the news. And if you remember, then Governor Mitt Romney dug up this law to prevent giving marriage licenses to people from out of state. Mm. It was this really gross thing he was doing. And Provincetown was one of eventually 13 towns that said, we're not enforcing that. That's ridiculous. So these guys, it's a comedy of errors, but they ended up being first in line. And then when people hear they're from Alabama, there was like a scrum of reporters that instantly surround these two guys that came here to get married quietly. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. You know, and I was one of them. And uh, it just was this comedy of errors that here's these two guys from Anniston, Alabama. And then they ended up on the front page of their hometown newspaper, but the New York Times covered their wedding. There was a radio station from Bogota, Colombia. I mean, and so, and it, and they were exhausted because they flew in the day before. It was this whole thing. So the, the, their story just so best re represents the spirit of that day here in Provincetown. Right. But it's a classic Provincetown story, mm -hmm. just how it's like Provincetown can grab a hold of you and just like spin you around and like they just were so confused oh, wow <laughs> and they got married in like what's now zoe lewis's front yard like it, you know so um now this is they're coming to visit town in may for their 20th wedding anniversary oh wow and i was yeah. like i would say i was the flower girl at their wedding it was me and 40 other reporters and so <laughs> wow. not the most romantic wedding but <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's um that's one of the ones that's coming up that i really want to get down oh yeah. wow i didn't know that story at all it's fine. And when they came back for their 10th anniversary, they got the key to the town. Really? Like, yeah, that was the last time they were here. Wow. And now they live on a farm, like on the Alabama Georgia line. Work. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, farmers, gay farmers. So. We love that. So, where does everybody hear your stories? So, if you go to archive.storycore.org um, and you could search, for, it's, it's a great rabbit hole if like, you're just hanging out at home one night and, um, and you, you can search through keywords. Mm -hmm. And then the longer, the interview is up there. Um, it goes through software so that it picks up keywords. And then you can also use finding aids like, you know, um, yourself. But if you search for Provincetown, they'll come up. And there's other people in Provincetown who have done them mm -hmm. that you'll see interviews. Or any, anybody even that mentions the word Provincetown, you know, that they went on vacation once, it will oh, wow. pop up. Um, you can search by my last name. You could search by, uh, you know, people in town, themes in town. And, uh, and you can also sign up yourself to do it. Like I really encourage, I mean, you guys do it too. You're creating this historical record. These shows will live on on the internet for the future. It's so important, particularly for a town like this. Cause I think Provincetown um, gets talked about a lot, mm -hmm. but um, we're so lucky that we have so much independent media here mm -hmm. that we can't take it for granted. And it just contributes, um, you know, such a, a clear historical record. I remember you saying that when we talked about this. Yeah. 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 I can't wait to hear yours. To be, a, to be like a super nerd, re the recording technology, the oldest existing recorded recording is only 165 years old. During the Vietnam War, they invented recording. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, <laughs> but if you would think, like if you said to, to me or anybody like, Here, wait, here's a recording that's 500 years old, I wouldn't care what they were talking about. I would just want to hear what people 500 years ago were talking right, absolutely. about. Absolutely. And that's what I think with any any media that's recorded and put out there that um, as with time and you go back, you're like, oh, like that explains a lot. Like it explains history to you. You know, when everyday people are explaining their experiences, mm -hmm. not just those in power. Right. I love that. And then maybe we won't keep repeating our uh, mistakes through history. That would be nice. When does the first issue of the Provincetown Magazine come out this year? Uh, let's see, it'd be like about around April 11th ish. Mm -hmm. cool. So yeah, we start the, the treadmill starts up. It's gonna be an interesting season. I think. Who do you got planned for the cover? I don't know yet. Ooh. I don't know. That's always, I often said we should just put out a cover cause I think that's all the people care about. <laughs> <laughs> and I also said we should put out a cover with a mirror on it. It's like, are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my God. But um, no, it's gonna be cool. And I scored Rachel Maddow tickets. Oh, wow. oh wait, I those went it, like, so fast. They went like that, because I saw it and I was like, I was gonna go upstairs to ask Peter, I'm like, should we go? Because we're supposed to talk about spending money. But, <laughs> Always buy <laughs> a healthy like relationship. That. I know, yeah. <laughs> I don't do it, but like, but uh, so I was like, oh no, no, like, and I, but then I was like, if I go upstairs and ask him, do you wanna mm -hmm. go, he'll be gone. And it, I think wait, it went that fast. When is the show? She is going to be here May 26th, I believe, mm -hmm. that Sunday Memorial Day. She said something on her show about yeah. it. And then instantly. She also mentioned Dang. her support for the Province on Bookshop as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. On, on and that's the show. thing, too. Like, listen to her podcast and read this book because, like, she is, like, it's fighting fascism and it's, like, 
five alarm fire. Mm -hmm. I don't, she doesn't strike me as a hyperbolic person. Mm -hmm. So when you read this book and listen to the podcast, you're like, oh, yeah, we have a big, big problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk about repeating history. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for yeah. being here. Thanks for having it's me. Good to see you always. Good to see you too. I can't wait to hear about the history of Provincetown drag. That's yeah, exciting. Yeah, it's in the Provincetown arts issue where John Waters was on the cover. Word. They still sell it at the bookstore. Oh, no way. Cool. Great. Um, let's head on over to Babes and Boys now to find out everything going on this week. Aaron Gobra, and there is whiskey in the jar this weekend, St. Paddy's Day weekend. Starting off Friday on March 15th, you can hit the Friday night flow chart. RuPaul, RuPaul, Clint, and Brittany, and Hillary Tamar. And at Water's Edge Cinema, Love Lies Bleeding and Perfect Days are starting off this week. Then at the Truro Library, there is a play reading 4 a.m. Friends at 2 p.m., Featuring noted Provincetown locals such as Jen Cabral, Ian Leahy, and Darlene Van Alstein, and Bronwyn Jacket. Then later on, you can sashay over to the Crown Point for their Shamrock Sashay, where you can get a three-course dinner paired with specialty cocktails, a bill available starting Friday, March 15th through Sunday, March 17th. Later on that night, you can catch live music at the Underground, St. Paddy's Day live music, for a St. Paddy's Day party. And then on Sunday itself, St. Paddy's Day, may the road rise up and meet you and lead you to the Provincetown Brewing Company, where Carmen and I will be serving you up my family's famous corned beef and cabbage recipe, along with some sweet treats. This is a fundraising event for Babes and Boys, so head on over to our Eventbrite at babesandboys.com for more information. And if that's not enough, you can also go over to the Shipwreck Lounge. They'll be starting at noon with Bailey Specialty Cocktail Drinks. And Chris Grasso will be playing later on live music from 3 to 6. Finizzi's will also be serving some Irish fare all week, so go and check out Finizzi's. I hear it's some pretty good stuff. Then, the old reliable Alley Rats will be playing some St. Paddy's Day tunes at 4.30 over at the Squealing Pig. And if you're looking for some more music, over at Tin Pan Alley, they have their fourth winter tea with Mary Callahan and Brian Patton from 2 to 5 p.m. They also have corned beef and Guinness beer there, too. And then, to round out the St. Paddy's Day events, Abby Cummings will be hosting the Luck of the Irish Bingo over at the Governor Bradford starting at 6 p.m. And then, if that's not enough, there is a Mario Kart Madness tournament hosted by Giselle on Tuesday, March 19th over at the Crown and Anchor. It's $20 to enter. I know Harrison's been talking a big game, but we'll see what happens when he puts the to the metal. This is a fundraiser for Summer of Sass. Then on Wednesday, March 20th, there's a reading of the Jack of Hearts Club written by John Richardson over at the Provincetown Theatre. Tickets are free at provincetowntheatre.org. Then on Thursday, Tap Room Trivia Women's Month continues, this time featuring Pop and Dutch's very own Rebecca Orchant. And over at Tin Pan on Thursdays, Jake and Giselle will be accompanying Dumpling Night and singing and crooning away for you. Upcoming next week, keep your calendars marked for the 24th, where there will be a watch party over at Water's Edge Cinema for Lesbian Visibility Week. We're going to watch Love Lies Bleeding, so come check us out, learn about lesbian visibility, and see us over at Water's Edge Cinema. If there's anything you'd like to see on next week's roundup, please email babesandboys.com. And of course, as always, be safe this weekend. Have so much fun. Enjoy being Irish just for one day. And if you're lucky enough to be Irish, well, then you're lucky enough. Thank you, Carmen and Sam. It's yes. going to be a fun weekend. St. Pat's, what, what? Yeah, make sure to come to the brewery and get some corned beef. <laughs> Please welcome to the show Sam Pollock. He is our independent voice this week. Thank you for making some time to be yeah. here. Thanks for having me. Um, first of all, let's talk about how long you've been with the paper. Um, I've been with the paper about a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what brought you to Provincetown? Or? Yes, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Where from? I'm from Brookline, Massachusetts, right outside oh. Boston. But my family, you know, we came, we're part timers, so we. Cute. We grew up coming here. I'm yeah. just kidding. Where, where <laughs> did you study? Um, I studied at Wesleyan University, Connecticut. Yeah. Nice. Well, welcome to the family. Yeah. You. You're enjoying Province is treating you well so far? Yeah, I'm loving it. And yeah. you're loving working. At I the mean, paper. it's my second winter, so I. You made it. I made it. We're almost out, right? <laughs> I feel like once the time changes, it's like winters. Yeah, I, I feel like feels, a, yeah. a relief. Yeah. The funny yeah. thing is, I didn't know the time was changing until I watched the Babes and Boys segment. <laughs> Oh That's how I was like, oh. <laughs> we got you covered. Yeah. Thank um, you. Right. 
Uh, so what kind of stories are, have you been covering at the Private Center Independent? Yeah, so uh, my beat, quote unquote, mm -hmm. is, is Wellfleet news. So I cover a lot of Wellfleet town politics, mm -hmm. government. Um, and then um, on top of that, I do a lot of uh, housing uh, coverage of mm -hmm. evictions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've covered evictions at the Truro Motor Inn in, in Truro. I've covered uh, evictions in, at an ADU in Wellfleet, um, eviction at the Governor Bradford in Provincetown after LexVest took it over, mm -hmm. um, and now uh, a series of evictions that have been happening for a while at, uh, up at Nappyville. Mm. Tell everybody who isn't quite sure what Nappyville means. Yeah, so Nappyville um, is a sort of, uh, a, it's a property on Bradford Street, a complex of um, apartments. It's sort of a magical, if a slightly dilapidated uh, property um, that was owned by the late uh, uh, restaurant owner Nappy, Anton Nappy Van Derek. Um, um, and so the, the, comp the property Nappyville is kind of lovingly uh, named after him. Um, he passed away in 2019, um, and ever since um, his the, the property and everything that he's owned has sort of been in the control of his longtime financial advisor, um, Bernard McEnany, who is um, basically since um, Nappy died, has been sort of carrying out series of evictions of Nappy's longtime employees and sort of Nappy didn't have kids. He didn't um, have any, you know, besides him and his wife, mm -hmm. um, his employees were his family. Um, and um, and after Nappy died, his, his longtime employees, many of them who were Jamaican, um, I believe seven, um, Longtime employees were evicted immediate, pretty immediately after, um, um, and 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 fired from Nappy's restaurant. How many apartments are at Nappyville? Yeah, so that's 14 units and a total of I think around 16 bedrooms. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's most full capacity. It's it's housed around I think 30 30 folks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, most all employees at Nappy's. A lot of them uh, were employees at Nappy's. Only one is currently an, uh, still an employee at Nappy, oh. um, uh, but if not Nappy's, a lot of them work in the trades. Um, they work in hospitality. Uh, mm -hmm. They're you know employees at other restaurants and other you know um, businesses that are so integral to sort of our seasonal economy here. Mm -hmm. And what's the rationale for for doing this right now? So. Uh, Tenants at, at Nappyville got uh, a notice on January 18th uh, that they had to be out by April 1st because um, Bernard McEnany and um, his colleague Lisa Meads, who is the property manager up at Nappyville, are planning on selling the property. Um, basically, uh, the property has been under sort of uh, health orders from the town since 2020, a year after Nappy died. Um, and then it sort of there's this, uh, this fight that has played out between um, the property owners and uh, the town to sort of get this property, which has sort of um, had many viola health code violations um, up to code. Um, and the property owners, unfortunately, have not been doing that. The town has sort of been, you know, putting pressure on them. And, and ultimately, they in the letter that they, they, they sent to the tenants, said that the reason why they're selling is because, you know, they've been under all this pressure from the town. They can't afford to you know pay all these fines that they've racked up they've racked up twenty thousand dollars of fines from the town um, they can't afford to hook up to the sewer system um, uh, things like that and so that's essentially why they're they've decided to sell wow <laughs> um, so how do the um, the employees that don't live there anymore they've started working in trades in town yeah so they're no longer connected to nappies yeah yeah so I mean uh, Regardless of, of whether they no longer work at Nappy's, they a lot of the people that I talked to, you know, were really close to Nappy and his family. Um, Na uh, Nappy's wife Helen Hanstrup, who he ran the restaurant with, um, in 2018, a year before he died, was diagnosed with dementia mm -hmm. and sort of uh, was really kind of getting worse. And a lot of the people that I talked to were sort of really close with Helen and, and Nappy, and, and took a lot of care of Helen after Nappy died. Um, kind of as a proxy to to Nappy, um, and you know, in in conjunction with this this court battle over um, getting control of Nappy's estate, which is uh, assessed at like eighteen million dollars of of properties and art. Wow. Um, Bernard McEnany also won conservatorship over Helen mm. because she was declared unfit to manage Nappy's estate. Right. Um, and so 
since uh, he won the, the conservatorship case in October 2021, you know, these, these longtime employees and sort of chosen family of Nappy have not been able to see Helen. Um, she's been in uh, uh, staying in between Florida and North Carolina at private Airbnbs um, away from her home in Provincetown, and they've not been able to see her or contact her since. This is heartbreaking. Yeah, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, so this person is in control of an $18 million estate, but is selling because he can't afford to hook up to the sewer? Yes. Right. And okay. yeah. <laughs> um, right. Okay. April 1st is in two weeks. So like most of these people have nowhere to so live. So they have nowhere to live. I think only one uh, family unit has found, they've moved in with their family in Truro and then the rest are still are still looking. And obviously April is like the worst time to be evicted as everyone is sort of- Everyone's looking. Scrambling to, to look for summer housing. Right. And the people that I know that are looking are not having any luck. Right, so this, these are 13 more people that are gonna be looking for for housing. Um, and as you, as the story develops, I mean, how do you see it playing out? Yeah, I mean, that's the question. Um, I think it's kind of clear that uh, these folks aren't gonna make the April 1st deadline. And I think that the property owners know that and understand that. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, it's a, a question of what can happen on the property. It's, a, it's in the historic district. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot of historical significance actually in the 1920s, one of the buildings was a a theater mm -hmm. uh, for the Barnstormers troupe, which was right. this avant-garde mm -hmm. theater troupe. You know, uh, Eugene O'Neill put on some plays there. It said that Betty Davis performed there. So it has a lot of historical significance and whether, you know, uh, our, the bylaws in town are, are set up in a way that can preserve such a, you know, historically important property um, is also a big question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what can be done with the property? It's not at the point where it will be condemned and torn down though. No, so yeah, so the, the town has been sort of walking a fine line of, you know, how do we get these folks to repair this property and bring it up to compliance so that people can live here without, you know, condemning it. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a hearing, a Board of Health hearing in October where they were planning on discussing whether to condemn the property altogether. And the Board of Health Chair, uh, Susan Troyan, told me, you know, we decided not to, to go ahead with that hearing because the last thing we want is to, you know, displace these people um, mm -hmm. and condemning such a property would, would displace them. Unfortunately, you know, in the end, um, they're being displaced. Right. What ended up happening at the Churro Motor Inn? Yeah, so a similar sort of situation where um, this was a property where up to 50 folks uh, lived. Um, it was, a, it was a, uh, an inn, a, a motel for a while. 2015, it kind of, the property owners, uh, David uh, Delgizzi, um, who is a, a pretty notorious tax uh, evader, um, essentially converted the property into year-round housing without actually renovating any of the units. So they were essentially motel rooms being used by families mm -hmm. as year-round uh, units. It had a failed septic system. It was, uh, you know, operating on two cesspools of uh, property of 50 people. Um, it had, you know. DIY electrical work that was, you know, a fire hazard. It had the minimum square footage was not, um, you know, legal for like a family of four. Right. So the town um, initiated legal action against the property owners in 2019, um, taking them to court, basically saying you need to bring this property up to, to code if you're going to be housing these folks. Um, and basically gave, gave them essentially an ultimatum, either you give us a design plan for your septic upgrade and your plans on how you're going to bring this property up to code, or you're gonna help relocate these 50 tenants. Mm -hmm. um, the property owners didn't did neither, um, and the court found them in, in contempt and sort of through a settlement, um, they the court ordered that they hire basically a Boston consulting group, a housing consulting group that would sort of do the, the grunt work of finding housing for these people and relocating them. The property owners were to pay for the relocation expenses. Um, and so over the course of a couple years, carried out a series of court ordered evictions. I think it, by then it was probably 12 people, 12 evictions. Um, 
the property owners ended up not paying a penny for the, the relocation. So they went against the, the court order. Um, and again, again, yeah. Um, and since then the, the property has been condemned and it's been empty, sitting empty, you know, a, a property where 50 people once lived is sitting empty in Jura. Thank you for all this cheerful <laughs> yeah. news. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so happy, happy spring. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for covering this yeah. hard work. I mean, your beat is pretty depressing right now, but um, thank you for doing it. Yeah. I I mean, I imagine this is I imagine in, in the future the way the chips will fall is I'm guessing it'll end up being a single family home at some point. We don't know. Happyville? Yeah. Yeah. We just like what know. else could happen? Right. I mean anything could happen, but what's most likely we just, I imagine they were, is that. They, the, in the, the letter, the eviction letter, uh, tenants all the tenants were told was we have interested parties who are have a different vision for the property. Um, so what we know is that those 14 units are not going to be 14 units. Right. That's all we know. Yeah, it's really sad. Um, can you end on a high note? A knock knock joke, maybe? Um, <laughs> the least a local program that the town's doing is exciting. Oh, that is There's, exciting. There is a lot of exciting affordable housing projects yes. in the works. Um, so it's, 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 it is, while it is really depressing news, it is sort of a two steps forward, one step back mm -hmm. situation. We are in a very weird time period where there's never been this many affordable housing projects down the pipeline right and like people that are getting forced out it's all coming to a head right now right. yeah the the sort of timeline that people are being pushed out of their homes faster than these affordable right. unfortunately the affordable housing pr process is a slow one right um but it will get there um yeah. fingers crossed yes Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much for coming in. Tell the people Thank how you. they can support the local journalism. Yeah, project. you can go to our uh, website at provincetownindependent.org. There's a donate button right up top. Um, you can subscribe. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one more thing before we go. Uh, this past week, a giant in the fight for LGBT rights over the past 30, 40 years passed away, David Mixner. Um, we hope to continue the work that he has started 30 years ago and continue to mold the world in the vision he created. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you to all our sponsors, the Crown and Anchor, the Provincetown Brewing Company, the Boat Slip, the Provincetown Business Guild, and also Shipwreck at the Brass Key. And also, thank you for waking up in Provincetown. Wherever you are. We'll see and you next week. Yeah, we'll see you next Friday. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Wake up. Wake up, wake up. In Provincetown.